60 Minutes Rewind. Rarely does the U.S. government want anyone more than it wanted this man. His name is Victor Boot, and he's known as the Merchant of Death. U.S. government officials say Boot became the world's most notorious arms dealer by fueling civil wars around the world. Courted by drug lords and dictators, the U.S. saw him as a threat because of his ability to arm terrorists targeting the United States. A former Russian military officer, Boot has been protected by powerful friends and long considered untouchable by law enforcement. But three years ago, the DEA devised a bold undercover operation to capture him. This past week, they brought him to New York to face terrorism charges. Tonight, those at the heart of Operation Relentless, a sting that spanned three continents, tell the story behind it for the first time. Victor Boot, uh, in, in my eyes, um, is one of the most dangerous men on the face of the earth. On the face of the earth. Without a doubt. Mike Braun, the former chief of operations for the U.S. Drug Enforcement Administration, told us Boot first exploded on the scene in war-torn West Africa in the late 1980s. Elevating bloody conflicts from machetes and single-shot rifles to... AK-47s, not by the thousands, but by the tens of thousands. So he weaponizes civil war in Africa. He transformed these young adolescent warriors into uh, insidious, mindless, maniacally driven killing machines that operated with assembly line efficiencies. Now 43, boot from the Soviet Republic of Tajikistan, is a mystery man who reportedly served in the Soviet Air Force and Intelligence Service. The U.S. has indicted him on four terror-related charges, including conspiracy to kill Americans. What makes him a threat to the United States? He is a shadow facilitator. He's arming not only designated terrorist groups, uh, insurgent groups, but he's also arming very powerful drug trafficking cartels uh, around the globe. Taking advantage of Russian military contacts at the highest levels and the collapse of the Soviet Union, Federal prosecutors allege Boot essentially became a one-stop shop, offering an unlimited supply of stockpiled Cold War weapons to bad guys around the world, including Charles Taylor of Liberia, who's now on trial for war crimes. According to the U.S. indictment, Boot had a unique selling point when it came to weapons trafficking, a fleet of cargo airplanes capable of transporting weapons and military equipment anytime, anywhere. More than 60 planes in all, his own private air force. Those Russian aircraft uh, were built like flying dump trucks. He could move this stuff and drop it with pinpoint accuracy to any desert, to any jungle, to any other remote place in the world, right into the hands of what I refer to as the potpourri of global scum. By the late 1990s, Boot was a legend in the shadowy world of illicit arms dealing. So elusive that the only two pictures that surfaced of him back then were taken without Boot's knowledge by a Belgian photographer. Later, Boot became the inspiration behind the Nicolas Cage character in the movie, Lord of War. I was an equal opportunity merchant of death. I supplied every army but the Salvation Army. U.S. Treasury documents reveal a Boot empire so sophisticated, so complex, hidden behind a thick curtain of front companies, that even the U.S. government unwittingly contracted with two of his companies to deliver supplies to U.S. troops in Iraq. Juan Zarate, Deputy National Security Advisor in the second Bush White House and a CBS News consultant, told us hiring Boot was a mistake. This was one of the grave complications for the United States. Uh, Victor Boot's tentacles reached so far and so deep that he had uh, access to uh, planes that could provide services for the U.S. government. Zarate admitted the U.S. could do business with Boot, but he couldn't catch him. I had always thought of Victor Boot as untouchable. Uh, and I also, frankly, didn't think uh, that anyone could get to him. A challenge Zarati from the White House threw out at a meeting with Mike Braun and his DEA team. The DEA had just pulled off a string of extraordinarily successful captures of high-value terrorism targets around the world, like Afghan drug lords. DEA agents live for the hunt. Had Mike, no one had even gotten a sniff on this guy. Let me tell you something, Armin. When, when I'm, I'm sitting there next to Juan and my guys are sitting across the table from him, the very best that our government's got to offer 
and he tosses this out on the table and I look him in the eyes and they're looking back at me like, we'll do this. this we can do this. But it was about a 5% chance in the back of my mind. And so, um, you know, I wished them well uh, and I went back to the White House. Mike Braun's thinking 95%, okay? Five and 95 make 100. He was, he was going down. He was in our crosshairs. The DEA supervisor put in charge of the hunt for Victor Booth was Louis Milioni. We felt that we could create a scenario that would, uh, that would pull him in. The plan was to pull Booth out of Moscow with a huge arms deal he couldn't refuse. To do that, the DEA hired an undercover agent to contact a trusted associate of Booth's named Andrew Smolian. The DEA operative said he had a big business deal for Booth. I'm thinking in terms of fishing here. It's almost like you've thrown the line in the water. There's a little bit of bait. Uh, this is a business proposition, and you're waiting to see if anything comes back with a nibble. We're really waiting to see what, yeah, exactly what, what Smolian says and um, you know, what he says about boot. And that as it comes back, spoke to Boris, anything possible with farming equipment. That's correct. Boris was code for boot, farming equipment for weapons. That exchange led to the island of Curaçao, a few hundred miles off the coast of Colombia. It was here that Boots' bunny, Andrew Smolian, would first meet the two DEA undercover operatives posing as officials in the Colombian rebel terrorist group known as the FARC. The two fake rebels, Eduardo and El Comandante, would say they want to buy millions of dollars worth of weapons to fight the Colombian army and the U.S. military pilots protecting them. Simoleon has to believe that Eduardo and El Comandante are real. Right, if Simoleon doesn't believe it, we're done and um, and we go home. The meeting is about to take place. What's your temperature like? Your, your heart rate goes is up a little bit and you, your, your adrenaline's going a little bit, you have butterflies. Emotions that only escalated when at this hotel in Curaçao, the fake rebels tell Simoleon, Boots' buddy, they want to spend $12 million on everything from sniper rifles to surface-to-air missiles. He bites off on it. In fact, he eats the whole thing whole. So it was, it was very successful. So successful, Smolian immediately flew to Moscow to present the deal to Boris, the man the DEA believes is boot. Two weeks later in another meeting, this time in Copenhagen, Smolian told the DEA operatives that his Russian business partner really liked the deal and then he revealed who that man in Moscow really is. You know who this man is that we're getting the weapons from. This is Boot, B-O-U-T. He's wanted by the world. They call him the Merchant of Death. B-O-U-T. Yeah, he spelled it out for him. We marveled that Smolian would do that, but it was just great evidence. The DEA was in the game, but Boot was still safe and secure in Russia and reluctant to leave. The DEA undercovers insisted they couldn't go to Moscow, but had to meet Boot to seal the deal. And Boot's going to know that that's how these deals are going to work. Comandante is not going to release these millions of dollars for these weapons to anybody until he at least shakes hands, talks, looks Boot in the eye, and then we can move on. That's how we countered, and, and Boot went for it. Next stop, Romania, just three days later. The play was to entice Boot to Bucharest claiming that's where the money was stashed to pay for the weapons. Boot said he'd come, but then he had trouble getting a visa. The case stalled. After 10 days of waiting for Boot, the top DEA agent made a gutsy call to walk away. So you've been chasing this guy hard for two months. You are almost got him, and you got to make the decision to step away from the table. If we were real, we wouldn't stay there forever. We're going to now step away and say, look, we need to take care of some other things, but it's time for us to leave. The story will continue after this. Over the next two weeks, Milioni came up with a new plan to reel Boot in. The phony rebels told Boot they would be in Bangkok soon. Asked if he could get there, Boot agreed. The morning Boot arrived in Bangkok, the DEA and Thai police had gathered downtown waiting for word from cops at the airport that the merchant of death had landed. They call us in the room and they tell us that he's here. What I mean, was the, the was, moment like there? It was just unbelievable because we knew at that point, you know, you're kind of like holding on as you climb up the mountain at different points in the investigation. This was one where at that point I believed and the other investigators believed not only are we in the game, he shows up at this meeting, we've got him. 
He's going to be arrested. Boot drove to this hotel and met the two fake arms buyers in a conference room on the 27th floor. Here, the DEA's undercover team told Boot they want his weapons to kill Americans. The Comandante and Eduardo make it very clear. He said, we're fighting against the United States. Boot responds and says, look, they're after me too. He said, but we are together in this. They are my enemy also. Eduardo and Comandante talk about how they want sniper sights for the rifles that they have so that they could, quote, start blowing the heads off American pilots. Boot's response immediately is, yes. Then the DEA said Boot jotted down on these pages what he intended to deliver for $12 million, including between seven and 800 surface-to-air missiles. 5,000 AK-47s, anti-personnel mines, fragmentation grenades, um, armor-piercing rockets, money laundering services, and all within the context of speaking about a shared ideology of communism and fighting against the Americans. After two hours, one of the DEA undercovers made a call, a signal it was time to move in. Within minutes, the Thai police and DEA agents burst into the room. We see Boot across the far end of like a boardroom type table, standing up with his hands inside his briefcase. And they give him the command to put his hands up and he hesitates and they immediately focused in with their weapons and gave them the command again. Are you thinking we've come all this way to see Victor Boot shot by a Thai policeman? The thought did cross my mind that something really bad is gonna happen to him right here, but then he complied. It turned out there was no weapon in the briefcase. The disarming of Victor Boot was now officially complete. The Thais cuff him. He's taken into custody, Smolian's taken into custody. Does Boot say anything? The game is over, or something like that. The game is over. Right. But then a new game began. Boot became the center of a legal tug of war between the US and Russia, which wanted him released back to Moscow. Boot said he only went to Thailand as a simple tourist, not an arms dealer. Boot and the Russians managed to delay his extradition to America for more than two and a half years. But last Tuesday, after a sting that played out on three continents, the DEA finally got their man. They flew him to New York, where he pled not guilty to charges including conspiracy to kill Americans. When Boot rode under tight security in a convoy to jail in Manhattan, riding right along with him was Louis Milioni. This is the Lord of War, the Merchant of Death. Right. And you've got him in your hands. Right, he's in custody. It's a great feeling. It's an absolutely great feeling.